Chairs No Waiting, episode number 428, Howard Morris, Second Banana. Two Chairs No Waiting is brought to you each week by Weaver's Department Store. Drop by over at Weaver's and check out some of the great items they got. They got new things. I'm wearing one of them tonight. And it's a Barney Fife Fights Back t-shirt. You better gird your loins, Buster. You got a fight on your hands. Great t-shirt. Go check it out at Weaver's. You don't like that? Maybe you want a Barney face pillowcase. Great big face of Barney. You can sleep right there on it. You can also get ant bees, kerosene, cucumbers, all those things over at WeaversDepartmentStore.com. Two Chairs No Waiting is also brought to you by donations from listeners like you. Executive producer of episode number 428 is Rascal. Rascal, thank you so much for uh, supporting the show. Now, he supported the show by sending me some great information. Who am I, by the way? I'm Alan Newsom. Your host for Two Chairs No Waiting. I run imayberry.com and Weaver's Department Store and uh, mayberry.info and the thsrwc.com website and uh, Mayberry Barber. You can go check that out if you want to see me as the as Floyd. You can do that too. Folks, uh, I am a Mayberry nut just like you are. Well, I assume you may be a Mayberry Andy Griffith Show nut. Uh, I wouldn't even call us nuts. We're fans. We love it. So it was fun for me this week, uh, well, recently anyway, Rich, uh, who I'm calling Rascal, he's in the chat room with us usually, is Rascal. He is the designer of the artwork you see uh, for the Two Chairs No Waiting podcast, the Floyd the Barber and the, the lettering and everything. He, he drew that. Anyway, so Rich sent me a thing the other day uh, talking about an article he'd run across. Now, I don't know how to say this. But it's on a website. I'll show, I'll show folks in the video. You can see it. It's called T R A L F A Z. I don't know how. Trails, trails, trela, trail labs, labs, uh, trail labs. I don't know what that is. But it's about cartoons and trellasian fun. Trellasian. Trela, trela, I don't know how to say it. I barely speak regular English. Anyway, it was a great article he found out. Uh, uh, found me and sent to me uh, and you can go see it at the, I'll have a link on the show notes for this website. It's T R A L F A Z dot blogspot dot com. And you can check this out. It's a great story. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you about it, uh, but it's about Howard Morris, our very own Ernst T. Bass. Ernst T. Uh, he, he, uh, and it's written, this is from back in 1955, these articles. There's actually two articles. Uh, I'm going to try to read them both for you. Uh, one of them is called TV Star Achieves Note as the Little One. And the other article we're going to read is a Bonanza for Second Bananas. Now, that's where this uh, title of the podcast came from, Howard Morris, Second Banana. So if you're going to enjoy this, I know I am going to enjoy reading them to you. It's a, it, Like I said, these are from this first one is TV Star Achieves Note as the Little One is from... April the 13th, 1955. Okay, so this is way before he did Ernest T. Bass. But, oh, I should tell you, Howard Morris is Ernest T. Bass. Just in case you don't know who Howard Morris is, he is Ernest T. Bass. That's who he is. He, uh, he appeared on uh, many other things, and some of that's what we're about to hear about. But Ernest T. Bass himself, Howard Morris, is who we're going to be talking about. So let's head over there to the website. And read these articles. This one is from uh, United Press staff correspondent Jack Gaver, G A V E R. Hope I'm saying it right. But this, uh, he has filed this uh, long, long ago in 1955. So let's go check this out. Television has brought street recognition of a sort to Howard Morris. Those who spot him may not be able to lay tongue on his name immediately, but they don't really need to. Oh, you're the little one, they'll say. And that's an identification enough for themselves or for anyone else. Quote, the little one, end quote, can only be the one who isn't Sid Caesar or Carl Reiner, plus six footers, both, to Morris's five six. This member of the quartet that dominates the Caesar hour the fourth and distaffed member is Nanette Fabre, uh, is a legit dramatic actor turned comic who figures 
he has played about uh, 1,500 sketches in six years on television. Just imagine that, quote, he quoted, exclaimed the slight, serious-looking, funny man. This is, him. this is a quote from him. Quote, why, if a stage comic, uh, why, if a, why if a stage comic had a career of 50 years doing a re new review every year, he wouldn't appear in more than 250 sketches. Morris is one comedian who has no yearning to play Hamlet. He's done it. Well, not Hamlet exactly, but quote Hamlet, end quote. After New York schooling and a few seasons of acting apprenticeships with various groups, Morris spent four years in the Army during World War II. Three of those overseas in the Pacific with the entertainment unit headed by the then Major Maurice Evans, which, among other things, played a condensed version, version of Shakespearean tragedy, which was known as G.I. Hamlet. Morris was Latier's. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. I'll use Shakespearean scholars. Uh, anyway, back to the story. He was back in the role when a, when a civilian version was presented in Broadway or on Broadway in 1946. Quote, I was the first sergeant in Evans' unit. End quote. Uh, Morris recalled. Continue the quote. And do you know who was one of my men? Carl Reiner, end quote. Reiner has been with Caesar longer on an uninterrupted basis, but Morris was with him first. There's another quote from Howard Morris. That was when Sid did the very first television work, Morris explained. When Max Lobman, Lobman did the old Admiral Review show for a season more than six years ago. I was around doing all sorts of bits for a while. Out of that came Max's Your Show of Shows program for NBC, starring Sid and Imogene Coker. But by that time, I had a role in a stage musical, Gentlemen Prefer Bronze, where I stayed for a couple of seasons. When I joined Your Show of Shows in the fall of 1951, there was Carl again, end quote. But for all the benefits, Morris considers three one-hour shows a month about all he or any other actor can take. Quote from him again, quote, When that fourth idle week rolls around, he said, I try to forget about television for seven days and just stay home and relax, or maybe collapse is a better word. That's the end of that story. Uh, this, uh, and there's photos and stuff along with this. So if you go and look at the links I'm going to provide, you'll be able to see it. But that was, uh, again, that was from April, thir April 13th, 1955. Now we're going to hear another story. This is uh, a story from the New York Herald Tribune from December the 25th, 1955. And this is what our podcast is named for. It says, a bonanza for second bananas. By the way, today is Memorial Day in the United States. So that was another reason... Howard Morse was one of our veterans from the Andy Griffith Show, so thank him for his service. A bonanza for second bananas. It is inconceivable that an actor with stardom at his fingertips would reject it. But such a thespian, such thespians do exist, and Howard Morris may be counted among them. Morris is a diminutive pixie who, together with sidekick Carl Reiner, helps Sid Caesar dispense comedy on NBC's Caesar Hour. Caesar's Hour. Uh, he is what is known in the trade as a second banana, and Morris finds it a comfortable lot. It's a real cushy spot, says Morris, who avers uh, that his decision is not a compromise. With Caesar, I couldn't find a better showcase or a better opportunity to become versatile. The ultimate aim of any dedicated actor is to attain perfection and he can only achieve that by working constantly playing as many different parts as possible within his capabilities you know he continued years ago it was easy to tell the difference between the top banana and his second banana or a straight man 
the second banana would fill would feed a straight line to the top banana who'd advance to the footlights and hit the audience with a knock em dead punchline. But times have changed since then, and a guy gets a little more opportunity to show his talent. Oh, you're still called a second bananas, but now we're more important part of the bunch. Today, there are many different types of second bananas as there are styles of comedy. Why that we second bananas today have as many funny lines and bits as the top comics. Second bananas today, Howard explains, may be insulting, pessimistic, cynical, language fracturing, or character men who can play anything from uh, Persian generals to waterfront hoodlums. What's more, they have become among the best paid performers in television and have acquired almost as much of a following as the top bananas themselves. Viewers of Caesar's show are often moved into fits of laughter by Howard's antics. He particularly falls into a category of the aforementioned character type in that he is often called upon to play entitled noblemen, meek bank clerks, eccentric little music teachers, or Frenchmen, and the like. Howard's talent is unique in itself, combining a great sense of timing with an uncanny knack of facial expressions and posturing. He can sway an audience into symphony sympathy for a little man, squeeze every drop of humor out of a gag situation, yet subtly underscore a situation by merely letting the others take the four. He can take up the slack when the line of a funny of funny business wears thin in spots to Caesar, Howard's a funny man's funny man. Hard to imagine this little guy was once a Shakespearean actor. His heart is in television, though much as he enjoyed doing the bard. He loves Shakespeare, but he loves Caesar more. So, folks, I thought that was a, a fun little bit. I want to thank Rich for finding these things for me. These are from 1955, Howard Morris. And uh, I tell you, he he was always so fun to be around. He played so many um, strange characters on the Caesars Hour. If you've ever seen that, sometimes they show reruns, or not reruns, but skin, uh, what is it, cin- cinescopes of those. Uh, and it's hard to see just little bits of them only. But uh, Howard Morris was always amazing. So, again, I want to thank, uh, thank him for that. Thank him for sending those to me. And, folks, we got a, a few other things I wanted to tell you about. A few weeks ago, I did a podcast that was about uh, uh, George Lindsay, uh, you know, Goober himself. Well, check out this. I got a voicemail. It's a short but sweet from somebody uh, that kind of knew George Lindsay. Hey, Alan. George Lindsay Jr. here. Just call a check in and say, have a nice day. And Goober says, hey. <laughs> that was awesome. So I was able to talk to George. He's doing well. And uh, uh, it, was, it was so great to hear from him. He, he said he enjoyed the podcast episode about his dad. He enjoyed hearing some of the stuff that he had done in the past. His dad, you know, uh, being reminded of him. So thank you, George. Thank you for taking time to call and just say hey to our podcast audience here. I know I know we all enjoy hearing from everybody. Uh, I got a, a letter, an email from uh, a listener, and this is from Mike. I met him up in uh, Mayberry in the Midwest just a week or so ago. He says, Alan, it was a pleasure to finally meet you in person at Mayberry in the Midwest. I'm a big fan of Two Chairs No Waiting podcast and look forward to it each week. I consider myself a lifelong Andy Griffith Show fan, and Mayberry in the Midwest was my first ever Mayberry event. My wife and I were only there for the day on Saturday, so we missed out on some of the festivities, but we had a great time. We enjoyed meeting all the tribute artists, listening to some good music, and getting to see Gomer's buddy Duke, Ronnie Shell. And in general, spending the day with other Mayberry fans and devotees. Being a car person, I also really enjoyed seeing all the Mayberry squad cars because we had the Mayberry squad car 
nationals there during maybe in the Midwest. And he said, I'm trying to figure out how to get one for myself. Well, actually, Mike, I do know of a couple of people that are trying to sell one. So uh, if you want a 1965 one, let me know. Uh, let's see. Uh, now, don't flood me with answers for this or about that because uh, I don't know how long it will be for sale. But everybody that wants to let me know, I'll send you the information. I just, and Mike continues, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you and the other tribute artists for all the dedication to the fans and for your hard work in keeping Mayberry alive for the rest of us. I also want to thank you specifically for the weekly podcast, knowing it must be a lot of work to keep it going strong. Finally, I want to mention the Mayberry Cafe in the city of Danville, Indiana, for putting on this event. They were very instrumental in assisting in putting on that event. Uh, he says, we hope to make it for the entire weekend next time and maybe make a trip to Mayberry Days as well. Thanks again, Mike. Hey, Mike, thank you so much. I'm so glad that uh, you took time to write in. Uh, it's great. It's always great to hear from folks and to, to you know, find out folks. Folks, Mayberry in the Midwest was a great event. If you don't know about uh, events that are happening in and around uh, Mayberry, I want to encourage you to head over to imayberry.com and when you get there, go to the event calendar. The event calendar at imayberry.com is the same information contained in the bullet. So when you go there, you'll be able to see the Floyd's Barbershop Bulletin Board Mayberry event calendar of all the upcoming Mayberry events. Do not miss out, folks. If you have never been to a Mayberry event, I want to encourage you to head over and check out imayberry.com. Go to the event calendar and check it out. Uh, this next weekend, the 3rd of June, I'm going to be over in Valley Head, Alabama for a first time events, a very small town. They got some great t-shirts that say, uh, <laughs> it says, what does it say? Just like Mayberry without all the hustle and bustle. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this event. If you're in the Valley Head, Alabama area next weekend, as I record this, it'll be the 3rd of June, uh, uh, 2017 head over and check it out if if you're listening to this after that go to the event calendar and look for other events that you can go and attend definitely want to encourage that uh, another uh, email that i got was from bill and bill said alan uh, this is so much fun thanks for all you do talking about the podcast i'm just cracking up waiting for mondays because he comes to the live shows uh, for your podcast is just like it was in the 50 years ago, waiting for the Andy Griffith show in prime time. Wow. Our honor. He also, uh, he says, uh, two chairs, no waiting is a lot of fun for us. And thank you. He says, I'm doing a fantastic job. I appreciate that. He said, we like everyone else, I suppose have watched the Andy Griffith show hundreds of times episodes, hundreds of times. Of course, we throw lines at each other constantly and our family thinks we are all nuts, but we don't care. I hope to see you sometime. We're planning a trip to Mount Airy, but we don't know when. All the best. And that's from Bill. Bill, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And let's see, we got another voicemail from Rosalind. Let's hear from her. Hi, Alan. This is Rosalind. And I want to say to you, I am really enjoying the podcast in 2017. I love the fact that you have the Randy Turner segments. And I also love the clips that you have shown uh, about when Barney was singing in the choir and then about the one where the man came to town looking for a wife. I hope you will do more of those clips. It really enhances the podcast. And again, I just love the Randy Turner segments. It, he really gives us a lot of knowledge and I love it. So just keep up the good work, and you have a wonderful, blessed night or day, whichever time this is that you're <laughs> listening to this part, that you're listening to the phone call. Anyway, thank you so much for the work that you do. We really appreciate you. Bye. Thank you, Rosalind. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. And I have the same problem when I'm talking to you guys on the podcast. I don't know when you're listening to it, so I say good evening, good night, uh, whatever time it is for you. But thank you so much. I, I enjoy Randy's uh, segments as well. They are amazing, and I'm so glad that he's agreed to do those for us this year. 
we've got Randy coming up. So let's go ahead and do Randy. And then we got one more voicemail that I'll show you and a little bit of extra. Uh, I'll show you. I let you listen to and a little bit of extra as well. So let's head over and hear from Randy. <laughs> Welcome to This Week in Mayberry History, a report by special correspondent Randy Turner of the Gomer and Cooper Pyle Comic Book Literary Guild of the Mayberry Historical Society. Since 1949, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences has annually awarded the Primetime Emmy Award, the highest honor bestowed for excellence in primetime American television. 54 years ago this week, on May the 26th, 1963, Don Knotts won his third Emmy and became the first male actor to win three times in a row for playing the same character in the same series, a record that was later tied but remained unbroken for 25 years. Jane Wyatt was the first to win three Emmys in a row for the same series for playing Margaret Anderson in Father Knows Best. Don won the Emmy for Outstanding Performance in a Supporting Role every one of the first three seasons of The Andy Griffith Show. His third win in 1963 made him the first male actor to accomplish three wins in a row as the same character in the same series. Other actors did tie Don's record. In the 1960s, Don Adams for Get Smart, Carol O'Connor in the 70s for All in the Family, Michael J. Fox in the 80s for Family Ties, Jeremy Pivens for Entourage from 2006 to 2008, and in a role that could not be more diametrically opposed to Barney Fife, Brian Cranston won three times in a row as Walter White in Breaking Bad between 2008 and 2010. It was John Larroquette who not only tied Don's record, but finally broke it winning four times in a row as a supporting actor in Night Court between 1985 and 88. All that being said, Don Knotts as Barney Fife was the first. But that is not the only Emmy record Don attained, and the second Emmy record is one which still stands. During the sixth season, Don won another Emmy for the episode The Return of Barney Fife giving him yet another record at that time. No person had ever won four Emmys for playing the same character in the same series. During the seventh season, Don won yet again for a guest starring in Barney Comes to Mayberry, extending his record to five Emmy Awards for playing the same character in the same series, the most awards at that time for an actor or an actress. The record of five wins for the same character in the same series was held by Don Knotts exclusively until 1995 when Candace Bergen won her fifth Emmy for her show, Murphy Brown. In 2016, Julia Louise Dreyfus won her fifth Emmy for her work in Veep, tying the records held by Don and Candace Bergen. By the way, Julia also broke the record of John Larroquette as her five Veep Emmys were all won in a row. But while Don Knotts as Barney Fife was not only the first male actor to win three times in a row as the same character, he is the only male actor to win five Emmys for playing the same character in the same series. This fact is even more impressive considering that until 1966, the supporting character category in which Don won was not gender-specific, and until 1972 was not genre-specific, meaning that Don was competing with comedic actresses and dramatic actors and actresses when he won his Emmys. By the way, in 1967, when Don won his fifth Emmy for The Indy Griffith Show, Francis Bavier also won a primetime Emmy for supporting actress in a comedy series. She was the only other actor on the show to ever be nominated. Incredibly, Andy Griffith was never nominated, likely because he had made the decision early on to play the bedrock straight man surrounded by colorful characters such as Barney. That's it for this week. As always, thanks for listening, and remember to take Andy's advice and go out there and act like somebody. 
All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. I always enjoy Randy's uh, reports. He does a daily report as well. So if you'd like to today in Mayberry history, if you'd like to hear that, you can sign up for it. If you go to Turner's Grade at gmail.com and email him, he will start emailing you those reports. So thanks again. Wow, Don Knotts, all those Emmy Awards. That's amazing, amazing stuff. All right, so folks, I have one more voicemail for us. And I'm going to go ahead and play this one. This is from Paul Mulick, and he is discussing uh, the Return to Mayberry episode we did a while back. We I, I read some of this to you a week or so ago, but Paul took time to voicemail me, so I wanted to make sure you hear this, and let's go. Hey, Alan, it's Paul Mulick calling in again from Joplin, Missouri. Uh, you were talking in a recent podcast about the alternate ending for Return to Mayberry. They actually did film that ending. Uh, I've sent you a link to a uh, YouTube video that has a little brief snippet of it uh, with Gomer singing a solo with the choir at the wedding. Um, but they obviously cut it out and didn't include it in the final version. Also, uh, the movie's running gag has uh, Howard Sprague. Uh, keep, he keeps changing the color of his hair trying to impress a girl named Rose, and she was in that same scene too, uh, the one with Gomer singing the solo, uh, but that was completely cut out too, so we never do actually see Rose, I don't think, uh, in the finished version. Uh, just thought some folks might be interested in that. 10-4. All right, so Paul, thanks for doing that. Now, the report he uh, told us about is on YouTube, and I put a link in our show notes last episode and this episode for that same report. But I'm going to go ahead and play for you. I, I went in and downloaded that the video. The video has got not the audio is not really good on it. So I went through and tried to correct the audio. So I'm going to play this for you, and then I'll be back and we'll wrap this show up. But uh, this is a news report that was done during the filming of the Andy Griffith Show. Now the recording of the audio and the video that if you're watching the video, you'll see is a news report. And I believe it was recorded on VHS tape and then filmed, uh, using a video camera. They filmed the television. So, but, but anyway, that's why the audio is a little bad, but it is a treasure to have. So let's go and check this out. The show. Now, the last time we saw Andy, he had married his longtime sweetheart, Helen Crump and moved away. But this Sunday on NBC, Andy and the gang come back to Mayberry in a made-for-TV movie called Return to Mayberry. Once again, the occasion is a wedding, but this time, the lucky groom is none other than Barney Five. Twenty years ago, the Andy Griffith Show was as popular and wholesome as Aunt B's homemade apple pie. And today, thousands of dedicated fans are still caught in the Mayberry Time Warp, watching rerun after rerun. In some cities, the show airs as many as four to five times a day. Now, in an unexpected treat for Mayberry fans, the magic ingredients are coming back together for what may very well be the last production of the original Andy Griffith Show. Well, this is where it all began. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, stop tape. Twenty years later, roll them. And it's like we never, uh, where have we all been? It took me a few minutes when I first uh, did the first scenes, but uh, I couldn't remember. I was trying to find Gomer out there somewhere, but we finally came back. We have Gene Gene Gay Station in Mayberry, North Carolina, and we're certainly proud to be here on TV. I'm proud to be anywhere. <laughs> Andy, Opie, Gomer, Goober, and the entire cast had no trouble playing the friendly, simple folks of Mayberry. I think it was the chemistry. There's a certain truth, and no matter how silly or broad or crazy or zany situations might become, there's just a truth to those characters and what they have to offer, and it's something that everyone can relate to. And from the looks of things, uh, we still have it. I think this is going to be a good show. All right. Gomer went on to star in his own hit series, The Gomer Pyle Show. Opie ventured off to direct his motion pictures, Splash and Cocoon. And Don Knotts built on his image a very lucrative career on the silver screen. The only thing that rivals their success stories are their memories of Mayberry. 
uh, later on, I got more and more nostalgic about the show. It was beyond question the most uh, fulfilling experience I'd ever had in, in this business, doing this show, playing this character. Just being together, working together, we used to laugh all day long, you know, and get paid for it, too. That's almost sinful. <laughs> when I did this part, they had to age me, you know, so I could play old man darling. And uh, now they're trying to take a little age off <laughs> when I came back. But the one hardest hit by the last show of the old series was its star. We did our little scene. Well, little... where's Mr. So, we had our little party. And the crew was there, and Don and I were sitting in a couple of chairs, talking to one another. And after a while, we looked up, and everybody was gone. They were very quiet. They never did let us know that they were gone. And Don and I got up and walked out the door, and his car was over here, and mine was over here. And we said, well, let's call one another. She got us to. It was almost like life was over. When you part for 20 years, a lot of things can change, even in Mayberry. In this reunion show, the location for the set has changed to the charming village of Los Olivos, California. Opie has decided to raise a family and become editor of the Mayberry newspaper. Gomer becomes a great singer, and Andy has gone off to the big city. And who decides to get married? Barney. He's running for town sheriff. Could this be the same clumsy Barney Fife we all knew? It's his wedding that brings the entire Mayberry family back together. First, I was afraid we couldn't come up with the material. We did, I felt, what we had done the best that we could do. And I was afraid to come back several years later and just show up because we were cute or something. Or people, we thought people wanted to see us. But uh, Ron and Jack and I talked about it. Finally, uh, let's go for it. Once we started, it just went crazy. Happy wedding to you, Mr. and Mrs. Sheridan. Mayberry's small town magic, its warm morning smiles, and its open door have charmed the hearts of millions. For them, watching this return will be like attending a family reunion. Uh, we were never trying to do what has happened to this show, but we did. We created somehow a timeless little place. Uh, it was one of ours. <laughs> oh, Charlie. <laughs> Cut it, my friend. All right, so that's the report. Thanks, Paul, for sending it to us. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we've uh, had a little bit of fun tonight uh, remembering things. And I want to remind you about Howard Morris. One of the reasons we did it, he passed away on the 21st of May 2005, and he is one of our veterans. And there's, a, there's several on the, uh, that were cast members of the Andy Griffith Show, but Howard is definitely one I wanted to remember. You might want to head over to ErnestT.com and check out ErnestT.com. His son, David, still runs the site, and they have some uh, neat T-shirts over there. If you're not, you can't get them at Weavers because they're only sold at uh, ErnestT.com. And David uh, makes the shirts, and they also they all have they have uh, hand signed rubber rocks. They're like little rubber rocks that Howard has signed. They don't have very many of them, so if you want one, you better head over to ErnestT.com and check it out. Uh, David does a great job. I want to thank him for all he's done. He's been a great friend to me, and uh, it's just uh, it's a lot of fun. So head over to ErnestT.com and check it out. So, folks, I want to thank you all for being here and coming and visiting with me in Mayberry. It's fun to be with us every week. I enjoy getting to get together with you, find out, uh, just share Mayberry information with you. I hope you enjoyed as have as much as I do. I'd love to hear from you, like I heard from those folks that called in today or this episode. You can give me a call at 888-684-8415. You can email me at floyd at imayberry.com. Drop by twochairsnowaiting.com and leave messages. Leave messages on Twitter. Or not tw Well, not Twitter. I don't look there very often. But on Facebook and YouTube, however you'd like to get in touch with me, I love hearing from you. This show's about all of us fans of the Andy Griffith Show, and so I love to hear from you. Folks, have a great Mayberry week, and we'll see you next time right here on Two Chairs. <laughs>